Chapter Sixteen of Love Insurance by Earl Durr Biggers. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Sixteen. Who's Who in England? What's the matter with you? Seated in the lobby of the Della Pax on Sunday morning, Mr. Trimmer turned a disapproving eye upon the lank Englishman at his side as he made this query, and his question was not without good foundation for the aspirant to the title of lord harrowby was at the moment a jelly quaking with fear fancy meeting you after all these years said poor old george in an uncertain treble come come cried mr trimmer put a little more authority into your voice you can't walk up and claim your rights with your knees dancing the tango this is the moment we've been looking forward to act determined walk into that room upstairs as though you were walking into rakedale hall to take charge of it allan don't you know me i'm your brother george went on the englishman intent on rehearsing more like it said trimmer put the fire into it you're not expecting a thrashing you know you're expecting the title and recognition that belongs to you i wish i was the real lord harrowby i guess i'd show him a thing or two i wish you was agreed poor old george sadly somehow i don't seem to have the spirit i used to have a good point commented trimmer years of wrong and suffering have made you timid i'll call that to their attention five minutes of ten your lordship his lordship groaned all right i'm ready he said what is it i say as i go in oh yes he stepped into the elevator fancy seeing you after all these years the negro elevator boy was somewhat startled at this greeting but regained his composure and started the car mr trimmer and his proposition shot up toward their great opportunity in lord harrowby's suite that gentleman sat in considerable nervousness awaiting the undesired encounter with him sat miss meyrick and her father whom he had thought it necessary to invite to witness the ordeal mr richard minot uneasily paced the floor avoiding as much as possible the glances of miss meyrick's brown eyes ten o'clock was upon him and mr minot was no nearer a plan of action than he had been the preceding night every good press agent is not without a live theatrical sense and mr trimmer was no exception he left his trembling claimant in the entrance hall and strode into the room good morning he said brightly here we are on time to the minute ah i beg your pardon lord harrowby performed brief introductions which mr trimmer effusively acknowledged then he turned dramatically toward his lordship out here in the hallway stands a poor broken creature he began your own flesh and blood allan harrowby obviously mr trimmer had prepared speeches for himself as well as for poor old george for twenty odd and impecunious years he went on this man has been denied his just heritage we are here this morning to perform a duty my dear fellow broke in harrowby wearily why should you inflict oratory upon us bring in this um, gentleman that i will replied trimmer heartily and when you have heard his story digested his evidence i am sure yes yes bring him in mr trimmer stepped to the door he beckoned a very reluctant figure shuffled in george's face was green with fright his knees rattled together he made altogether a ludicrous picture and mr trimmer himself noted this with sinking heart allow me said trimmer theatrically george lord harrowby george cleared his throat but did not succeed in dislodging his heart which was there at the moment is seeing you after all these years he mumbled weakly to no one in particular speak up said spencer meyrick sharply who is it you're talking to to him explained george nodding toward lord harrowby to my brother allan don't you know me allan don't you know he stopped an expression of surprise and relief swept over his worried face he turned triumphantly to Trimmer. "'I don't have to prove who I am to him,' he announced. "'Why don't you?' demanded Trimmer in alarm. "'Because he can't, I fancy. 
put in lord harrowby no said george slowly because i never saw him before in all my life ah you admit it cried allan harrowby with relief of course i do replied george i never saw you before in my life and you've never been at rakedale hall have you lord harrowby demanded here wait a minute shouted trimmer in a panic oh yes i've been at rakedale hall said the claimant firmly i spent my boyhood there but you've never been there i what you've never been at rakedale hall why because you're not alan harrowby that's why a deathly silence fell only a little travelling clock on the mantel was articulate absurd ridiculous cried lord harrowby talk about impostors cried george his spirit and his courage sweeping back you're one yourself i wish i'd got a good look at you sooner i'd have put a stop to all this alan harrowby eh i guess not i guess i'd know my own brother if i saw him i guess i know the harrowby features i give you twenty-four hours to get out of town you blooming fraud the man's crazy alan harrowby cried raving mad he's an impostor this is a trick of his he looked helplessly around the circle in every face he saw doubt questioning good heavens you're not going to listen to him he's come here to prove that he's george harrowby why doesn't he do it i'll do it said george sweetly when i meet a real harrowby in the meantime i give you twenty-four hours to get out of town you better go victorious george turned toward the door trimmer lost between admiration and doubt turned also take my advice george proclaimed make him prove who he is that's the important point now what does it matter to you who i am nothing but it matters a lot about him make him prove that he's alan harrowby and with the imperious manner that he should have adopted on entering the room george harrowby left it mr trimmer eclipsed for once trotted at his side say cried trimmer in the hall is that on the level isn't he alan harrowby i should say not said george grandly doesn't look anything like alan trimmer chortled in glee great stuff he cried i guess we tossed a bomb eh now we'll run em out of town oh no said george we've done our work here let's go over to london now and see the pater that we will cried trimmer that we will by gad i'm proud of you to-day lord harrowby inside alan harrowby's suite three pairs of questioning eyes were turned on that harassed nobleman he fidgeted in his chair i say he pleaded it's all his bluff you know maybe said old spencer merrick rising but harrowby or whatever your name is there's altogether too much three-ring circus about this wedding to suit me my patience is exhausted sir clean exhausted things look queer to me have right along i'm more than inclined to believe what that fellow said but my dear sir that chap is a rank impostor there wasn't a word of truth in what he said cynthia you understand why yes i suppose so the girl replied you are alan harrowby aren't you my dear girl of course i am nevertheless said spencer meyrick with decision i'm going to call the wedding off again some of your actions haven't made much of a hit with me i'm going to call it off until you come to me and prove that you're alan harrowby a lord in good and regular standing with all dues paid but confound it sir a gentleman's word mr meyrick put in minot may i be allowed to say that i consider your action hasty and may i be allowed to ask what affair this is of yours demanded mr meyrick hotly father cried miss meyrick please do not be harsh with mr minot his heart is absolutely set on my marriage with lord harrowby naturally he feels very badly over all this minot winced come cynthia said meyrick moving toward the door i've had enough of this play-acting remember sir the wedding is off 
absolutely off until you are able to establish your identity beyond question and he and his daughter went out minot sat for a long time staring at lord harrowby finally he spoke say harrowby he inquired who the devil are you his lordship sadly shook his head you too brutus he sighed haven't i one friend left i'm alan harrowby ask jeffson if i weren't that policy that's causing you so much trouble wouldn't be worth the paper it's written on that's right too well admitting you're harrowby how are you going to prove it i've an idea harrowby replied everything comes to him who waits what is it a very good friend of mine an old oxford friend is attached to our embassy at washington he was planning to come down for the wedding i'll telegraph him to board the next train good boy said minot that's a regular idea better send the wire at once harrowby promised and they parted in the lobby below mr minot met jack paddock paddock looked drawn and worried working up my stuff for the dinner the little lismore lady is giving to the bridal party to-morrow night he confided say it's no sense to do two of them can't you suggest a topic that's liable to come up yes replied minot i can suggest one fake noblemen and he related to paddock the astounding events of the morning that sunday that had begun so startlingly progressed as a sunday should in peace early in the afternoon harrowby hunted minot up and announced that his friend would arrive monday noon and that the mayricks had agreed to take no definite step pending his arrival shortly after six o'clock a delayed telegram was delivered to mr minot it was from mr thacker and it read have located the owner of the yacht lilith its real name the lady evelyn stolen from owner in north river he is on his way south we'll look you up on arrival minot whistled here was a new twist for the drama to take at about the same time that minot received his message a similar slip of yellow paper was put into the hands of lord harrowby three times he read it his eyes staring his cheeks flushed then he fled to his rooms the elevator was not quick enough he sped up the stairs once in his suite he dragged out the nearest travelling bag and began to pack like a madman mr minot was finishing a leisurely and lonely dinner about an hour later when jack paddock ran up to his table mr paddock's usual calm was sadly ruffled dick he cried here's news for you i met lord harrowby sliding out a side door with a suitcase just now minot leapt to his feet what does that mean he wondered aloud mean answered mr paddock it means just one thing old george had the right dope harrowby is a fake he's making his getaway minot threw down his napkin oh he is is he he cried well i guess not come on jack what are you going to do i'm going down to the station and stop him he's caused me too much trouble to let him slide out like this a fake eh well i'll have him behind the bars to-night a negro cab driver was by superhuman efforts roused to hasty action he rattled the two young men wildly down the silent street to the railway station they dashed into the drab little waiting-room just as a voice called train for the north jacksonville savannah washington new york there he is paddock cried and pointed to the lean figure of lord harrowby slipping out the door nearest the train shed paddock and minot ran across the waiting-room and out into the open in the distance they saw harrowby passing through the gate and on to the tracks they ran up just in time to have the gate banged shut in their faces here cried minot i've got to get in there let me through where's your ticket demanded the great stone face on guard i haven't got one but too late anyhow said the face the train started through the wooden pickets minot saw the long yellow string of coaches slipping by he turned to paddock oh very well he cried exulting let him go come on he dashed back to the carriage that had brought them from the hotel the driver of which sat in a stupor trying to regain his wits and nonchalance what now paddock wanted to know get in commanded minot he pushed his friend on to the musty seat and followed 
to the daily packs he cried as fast as you can go but what the devil's the need of hurrying now demanded paddock all the need in the world replied minot joyously i'm going to have a talk with cynthia merrick a little talk alone ah said mr paddock softly love's young dream End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of love insurance by earl der vigors this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter seventeen the shortest way home the moon was shining in that city of the picturesque past its light fell silvery on the narrow streets the old adobe houses the listless palms in every shadow seemed to lurk the memory of a love long dead a love of the old passionate spanish days a soft breeze came whispering from the very sea ponce de leon had sailed it was as if at a signal a bugle call a rose thrown from a window the boom of a cannon at the water's edge the forgotten past of hot hearts of arms equally ready for cutlass or slender waist could live again and minot was as one who had heard such a signal he loved the obstacle that had confronted him wrung his heart left him helpless was swept away he was like a man who released from prison sees the sky the green trees the hills again he loved the moon was shining he stood amid the colorful blooms of the hotel courtyard and looked up at her window with its white curtain waving gently in the breeze he called softly and then he saw her face peering out as some senorita of the old days from her lattice i've news very important news he said may i see you a moment far better this than the telephone or the bellboy far more in keeping with the magic of the night she came dressed in white that set off so well her hair of gleaming copper minot met her on the veranda she smiled into his eyes inquiringly do you mind a little walk he asked where to say to the fort the longest way she glanced back toward the hotel i'm not sure that i ought but that will only make it the more exciting please and i've news real news she nodded her head and they crossed the courtyard to the avenue from this bright thoroughfare they turned in a moment into a dark and unkempt street see said minot suddenly the old spanish churchyard they built cities around churches in the old days the world do move it's railroad stations now they stood peering through the gloom at a small chapel dim amid the trees and aged stones leaning tipsily among the weeds at the altar of that chapel minot said a priest fell shot in the back by an indian's arrow sounds unreal doesn't it and when you think that under these musty stones lies the dust of folks who walked this very ground and loved and hated like you and yes but isn't it all rather gloomy cynthia meyrick shuddered they went on to pass shortly through the crumbling remains of the city gates there at the water's edge the great gray fort loomed in the moonlight like a historical novelist's dream its huge iron-bound doors were locked for the night its custodian home in the bosom of his family only its lower ramparts were left for the feet of romantic youth to tread along these ramparts close to the shimmering sea miss meyrick and minot walked truth to tell it was not so very difficult to keep one's footing but once the girl was forced to hold out an appealing hand french heels are treacherous she explained minot took her hand and for the first time knew the thrill that encountered often on the printed page he had mentally classed as rubbish wisely she interrupted it you said you had news he had but it was not so easy to impart as he had expected tell me he said if it should turn out that what poor old george said this morning was a fact that alan harrowby was an impostor would you feel so very badly she withdrew her hand you have no right to ask that she replied forgive me indeed i haven't 
but i was moved to ask him for the reason that what george said was evidently true alan harrowby left suddenly for the north an hour ago the girl stood still looking with wide eyes out over the sea left for the north she repeated there was a long silence at length she turned to minot a queer light in her eyes of course you'll go after him and bring him back she asked no minot bowed his head i know i must have looked rather silly of late but if you think i did the things i've done because i chose to you're wrong if you think i did them because i didn't love you you're wrong too oh i mr minot i can't help it i know it's indecently soon i've got to tell you just the same there's been so much in the way i'm wild to say it now i love you the water breaking on the ancient stones below seemed to be repeating shh shh but minot paid no heed to the warning i've cared for you he went on ever since that morning on the train when we raced the razorbacks ever since that wonderful ride over a god-forsaken road that looked like heaven to me and every time since that i've seen you i've known that i'd come to care more the girl stood and stared thoughtfully out at the soft blue sea minot moved closer over those perilous slippery rocks i know it's an old story to you he went on and that i'd be a fool to hope that i could possibly be anything but just another man who adores you but because i love you so much she turned and looked at him and in spite of all this she said slowly from the first you have done everything in your power to prevent the breaking off of my engagement to harrowby yes but weren't you overly chivalrous to a rival wouldn't what what you are saying be more convincing if you had remained neutral i know i can't explain it to you now it's all over anyway it was horrible while it lasted but it's over now i'm never going to work again for your marriage to anybody except one man the man who is standing before you who loves you loves you he stopped for the girl was smiling and it was not the sort of smile that his words were entitled to i'm sorry really she said but i can't help it all i can see now is your triumphant entrance last night your masterly exposure of that silly necklace your clever destruction of every obstacle in order that harrowby and i might be married on tuesday in the light of all that has happened how can you expect to appear other than foolish you're right and you couldn't possibly care just a little he stopped embarrassed poorly chosen words those last he saw the light of recollection in her eye i should say he went on hastily isn't there just a faint gleam of hope for me if we were back on the train she said and all that followed could be different and harrowby had never been i might you might yes i might not say what i'm going to say now which is hadn't we better return to the hotel i'm sorry remarked minot sorry i had the bad taste to say what i have at this time but if you knew and could understand which you can't of course yes let's go back to the hotel the shortest way he turned and looked toward the towers of the de la pax rising to meet the sky seemingly a million miles away so perry might have gazed to the north setting out for the pole they went back along the ramparts over the dry moat through the crumbling gates conversation languished then the ancient graveyard ghastly in the gloom after that the long lighted street of humble's shops and the shortest way home seemed a million times longer than the longest way there considering what you have told me of harrowby she said i shall be leaving for the north soon will you look me up in new york thank you minot said it will be a very great privilege cynthia meyrick entered the elevator and out of sight in that gilded cage she smiled a twisted little smile mr minot beheld mr trimmer and his proposition 
basking in the limelight of the de la pax and feeling in no mood to listen to the publicity man's triumphant cackle he hurried to the veranda there he found a bell-boy calling his name gentlemen to see you the boy explained he led the way back into the lobby and up to a tall athletic-looking man with a ruddy frank attractive face the stranger held out his hand mr minot of lloyd's he asked how do you do sir i'm very glad to know you promise thacker i'd look you up at once let's adjourn to the grill-room minot followed in the wake of the tall breezy one already he liked the man immensely well said the stranger over a table in the grill what'll you have waiter perhaps you heard i was coming i happen to be the owner of the yacht in the harbor where somebody has rechristened the lilith yes i thought so minot replied i'm mighty glad you've come a mr martin wall is posing as the owner just at present so i learned from thacker nervy lad this wall i live in chicago myself left my boat lady evelyn i called her in the north river for the winter in charge of caretaker this wall it seems needed a boat for a month and took a fancy to mine and since my caretaker was evidently a crook it was a simple matter to rent it never would have found it out except for you people too busy really ought not to have taken this trip business needs me every minute but i've got sort of a hankering to meet mr martin wall shall we go out to the boat right away no need of that we'll run out in the morning with the proper authorities the stranger leaned across the table and something in his blue eyes startled minot in the meantime he said i happen to be interested in another matter what's all this talk about george harrowby coming back to life well there's a chap here minot explained who claims to be the elder brother of alan harrowby his cause is in the hands of an advertising expert named trimmer yes i saw a story in a washington paper this morning george harrowby so called confronted alan harrowby and denounced alan himself as a fraud the man from chicago threw back his head and a roar of unexpected laughter smote on minot's hearing good joke said the stranger no joke at all george was right at least so it seems alan harrowby cleared out this evening yes so i was told by the clerk in there do you happen to know um alan yes very well indeed but you don't know the reason he left why answered minot i suppose because george harrowby gave him twenty-four hours to get out of town again the chicago man laughed that can't have been the reason he said i happen to know just how inquired minot do you happen to know leaning far back in his chair the westerner smiled at minot with a broad engaging smile i fancy i neglected to introduce myself he said i make automobiles in chicago and my name's george harrowby you you minot's head went round dizzily oh no he said firmly i don't believe it the other smile grew even broader don't blame you a bit my boy he said must have been a bit of a mix-up down here then too i don't look like an englishman don't want to i'm an american now and i like it you mean you're the real lord harrowby that's what i mean take it slowly mr minot i'm george and if alan ever gets his eyes on me i won't have to prove who i am he'll know the kid will but by the way what i want now is to meet this chap who claims to be me also his friend mr trimmer of course you do i saw them out in the lobby a minute ago minot rose i'll bring them in but but what is it oh never mind i believe you trimmer and his proposition still adorned the lobby puffed with pride and pompousness briefly minot explained that a gentleman in the grill-room desired to be introduced and graciously the two followed after the chicago george harrowby rose as he saw the group approach to his table suddenly behind him minot heard a voice my god and the limp englishman of the sandwich boards made a long lean streak toward the door minot leapt after him and dragged him back 
here trimmer he said your proposition has chilblains what's the trouble mr trimmer glared about him allow me said minot sir our leading vaudeville actor and his manager gentlemen mr george harrowby of chicago sit down boys said mr harrowby genially he indicated a chair to mr trimmer but that gentleman stood his eyes frozen to the face of his proposition the chicago man turned to that same proposition brace up jenkins he said nobody will hurt you but jenkins could not brace he allowed minot to deposit his limp body in a chair i thought you was dead sir he mumbled a common mistake smiled george harrowby my family has thought the same and i've been too busy making automobiles to tell them differently mr trimmer will you have a what's the matter man for mr trimmer was standing purple over his proposition i want to get this straight he said with assumed calm see here you cringing cur what does this mean i thought he was dead murmured poor jenkins in terror you'll think the same about yourself in a minute and you'll be right trimmer predicted come come said george harrowby pacifically sit down mr trimmer sit down and have a drink do you mean to say you didn't know jenkins here was faking of course i didn't said trimmer he sat down on the extreme edge of a chair as one who proposed to rise soon all this has got me going i never went round in royal circles before and i'm dizzy i suppose you're the real lord harrowby to be quite correct i am don't you believe it i can believe anything when i look at him said trimmer indicating the pitiable exclaimant to the title say who is this jenkins we hear so much about jenkins was the son of my father's valet george harrowby explained he came to america with me we parted suddenly on a ranch in southern arizona everybody said you was dead persisted jenkins as one who could not lose sight of that fact yes and they gave you my letters and belongings eh so you thought you pose as me yes sir confessed jenkins humbly mr trimmer slid farther back into his chair well he said it's unbelievable but henry trimmer has been buncoed i met this able liar in a boarding-house in new york and he convinced me he was lord harrowby it was between jobs for me and i had a bright idea if i brought this guy down to the wedding established him as the real lord and raised cain generally i figured my stock as a publicity man would rise a hundred per cent i'd be turning down fifty thousand dollar jobs right and left i suppose i was easy but i'd never mixed up with such things before and all the dope he had impressed me the family coat of arms and the motto the chicago man laughed softly credo harrowby he said that was it trust harrowby said trimmer bitterly lord what a fool i've been and it's ruined my career i'll be the laughing-stock oh cheer up mr trimmer smiled george harrowby i'm sure you're unduly pessimistic about your career i'll have something to say to you on that score later for the present for the present broke in trimmer with fervor iron bars for jenkins here i'll swear out the warrant myself nonsense said harrowby jenkins is the most harmless creature in the world led astray by ambition that's all with any one but allan his claims wouldn't have lasted five minutes poor allan always was a helpless youngster oh jenkins broke in minot suddenly what was the idea this morning i mean you're calling allan harrowby an impostor jenkins hung his head i was rattled he admitted i couldn't keep it up before all those people so it came to me in a flash if i said allan was a fraud maybe i wouldn't have to be cross-examined myself and that was really allan harrowby yes that was allan right enough mr minot sat studying the wall in front of him he was recalling a walk through the moonlight to the fort jephson and thacker pointed accusing fingers at him over the oceans and lands between i say let jenkins go continued the genial western harrowby provided he returns my property and clears out for good after all his father was a faithful servant 
if he is not but objected trimmer he's wasted my time he's put a crimp in the career of the best publicity man in america it'll take years to straighten out not necessarily said harrowby i was coming to that i've been watching your work for the last week and i like it it's alive progressive we're putting out a new car this spring an inexpensive little car bound to make a hit i need a man like you to convince the public mr trimmer's eyes opened wide they shone he turned and regarded the unhappy jenkins clear out he commanded if i ever see you again i'll wring your neck now mr harrowby you were saying just a minute said harrowby this man has certain letters and papers of mine no he hasn't trimmer replied i got em right here in my pocket he slid a packet of papers across the table they're yours now about jenkins was slipping silently away like a frightened wraith he flitted gratefully through the swinging doors a middle-class car explained harrowby and i want a live man to boost it beg pardon interrupted minot rising i'll say good-night we'll get together about that other matter in the morning by the way mr harrowby have you any idea what has become of allan no i haven't i sent a telegram this afternoon saying that i was on my way here must have run off on business of course he'll be back for his wedding oh yes of course minot agreed sadly he'll be back for his wedding good night gentlemen a few minutes later he stood at the window of three eight nine gazing out at the narrow street at the stately manhattan club and the old spanish houses on either side and she refused me he muttered to think that should be the biggest piece of luck that's come to me since i hit this accursed town he continued to gaze gloomily out the uh, moon was still shining End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of love insurance by earl durr biggers this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter eighteen a rotten bad fit minot rose early on monday morning and went for a walk along the beach he had awakened to black despair but the sun and the matutinal breeze elevated his spirits considerably where was allan harrowby gone with his wedding little more than twenty-four hours away if he should not return golden thought by his own act he would forfeit his claim on jephson and minot would be free to to what before him in the morning glow the great gray fort rose to crush his hopes there on those slanting ramparts she had smiled at his declaration smiled and labelled him foolish well foolish he must have seemed but there was still hope if only allan harrowby did not return mr trimmer his head down breathing hard marched along the beach like a man with a destination seeing minot he stopped suddenly good morning he said holding out his hand with a smile no reason why we shouldn't be friends eh none whatever you're out early so am i thinking up ideas for the automobile campaign and now laughed <laughs> you leap from one proposition to another with wonderful aplomb he said the agile mountain goat hopping from peak to peak trimmer replied that's me oh i'm the goat all right sad old jenkins put it all over me didn't he i'm afraid he did where is he ask of the railway folder he lit out in the night say he did have a convincing way with him you know it he surely did well the best of us make mistakes admitted mr trimmer the trouble with me is i'm too enthusiastic once i get an idea i see rosie for miles ahead as i look back i realize that i actually helped jenkins prove to me that he was lord harrowby i was so anxious for him to do it the chance seemed so gorgeous and if i put it over but there the automobile business looks mighty good to me now 
watch the papers for details and when you get back to broadway keep a lookout for the hand of tremor riding in fire on the sky i will promised minot laughing he turned back to the hotel shortly after his meeting with tremor had cheered him mightily with a hopeful eye worthy of tremor himself he looked toward the future twenty-four hours would decide it if only allan failed to return the first man minot saw when he entered the lobby of the de la pax was allan harrowby his eyes tired with travel handing over a suitcase to an eager black boy what was the use listlessly minot relinquished his last hope he followed harrowby and touched his arm good morning he said drearily you gave us all quite a turn last night we thought you'd taken the advice you got in the morning and cleared out for good well hardly harrowby replied come up to the room old man i'll explain there before we go up replied minot i want you to get miss merrick on the phone and tell her you've returned yes right away you see last night i rather misunderstood i thought you weren't allan harrowby after all and i'm afraid i gave miss merrick a wrong impression by gad i should have told her i was going harrowby replied but i was so rattled you know he went into a booth his brief talk ended he and minot entered the elevator once in his suite harrowby dropped wearily into a chair confound your stupid trains i've been travelling for ages now minot i'll tell you what carried me off yesterday afternoon i got a message from my brother george saying he was on his way here yes seems he's alive and in business in chicago the news excited me a bit old boy i pictured george rushing in here and the word spreading that i was not to be the earl of raybrook after all i'm frightfully fond of miss merrick and i want that wedding to take place to-morrow then too there's jephson understand me cynthia is not marrying me for my title i'd stake my life on that but there's the father and aunt mary and considering the number of times the old gentleman has forbidden the wedding already you saw it was up to you for once exactly so for my own sake and jephson's i boarded a train for jacksonville with the idea of meeting george's train there and coming on here with him i was going to ask george not to make himself known for a couple of days then i proposed to tell cynthia and cynthia only of his existence if she objected all very well but i'm sure she wouldn't and i'm sure too that george would have done what i asked he always was a bully chap but i missed him these confounded trains always late except when you want them to be i dare say george is here by this time he is minot replied came a few hours after you left and by the way i arranged a meeting for him with trimmer and his proposition the proposition fled into the night it seems he was the son of an old servant of your father's jenkins by name surely surely that was jenkins i thought i'd seen the chap somewhere couldn't quite recall well at any rate he's out of the way now the thing to do is to see good old george at once he went to the telephone and got his brother's room george a surprising note of affection crept into his lordship's voice george old boy this is allan i'm waiting for you in my rooms dear old chap said his lordship turning away from the telephone twenty-three years since he has seen one of his own flesh and blood twenty-three years of wandering in this god-forsaken country i beg your pardon minot i wonder what he'll say to me i wonder what george will say after all those years nervously allan harrowby walked the floor in a moment the door opened and the tall blond chicago man stood in the doorway his blue eyes glowed without a word he came into the room and gripped the hand of his brother then stood gazing as if he would never get enough and then george harrowby spoke is that a ready-made suit you have on allan he asked huskily why why yes george i thought so it's a rotten bad fit allan a rotten bad fit 
thus did george harrowby greet the first of his kin he had seen in a quarter of a century thus did he give the lie to fiction and to trimmer writer of fancy seeing you after all these years speeches he dropped his younger brother's hand and strode to the window he looked out the courtyard of the de la pax was strangely misty even in the morning sunlight then he turned smiling how's the old boy he asked he's well george speaks of you now and then think he'd like to see you why not run over and look him up i will george harrowby turned again to the window ought to have buried the hatchet long ago been so busy but i'll change all that i'll run over and see him first chance i get and i'll write to him to-day good great to see you again george heard you shuffled off not much alive and well in chicago great to see you suppose you know about the wedding yes fine girl too had a waiter point her out to me at breakfast rather rude but i was in a hurry to see her um, pretty far gone and all that Helen. pretty far gone that's the eye i was afraid it might be a financial proposition until i saw the girl allan shifted nervously uh, mm, of course you're lord harrowby he said george harrowby threw back his head and laughed his hearty pleasant laugh sit down kid he said and the sign of nobility thus informally addressed sat i thought you'd come at me with the title said george harrowby also dropping into a chair don't go mr minot no secrets here allan you and your wife must come out and see us got a wife myself fine girl she's from mary in indiana and i've got two of the liveliest little americans you ever saw live in a little chicago suburb homey house shady street neighbors all from down country way gibson's drawings on the walls george aid books on the tables phonograph in the corner with all of george m cohan's songs whole family wakes in the morning ready for a mccutcheon cartoon my boys talk about nothing but cubs and white Sox all summer they're going to a western university in a few years we raised em on james whitcomb riley's poems well allan well george say what do you imagine would happen if i went back to a home like that with the news that i was lord harrowby in line to become the earl of raybrook there'd be a riot wife would be startled out of her wits children would hate me be an outcast in my own family neighbors would turn up their noses when they went by our house fellows at the club would guy me lord harrowby eh take off your hats to his lordship boys business would fall off smilingly george harrowby took a cigar and lighted it no allan he finished a lord wouldn't make a hell of a hit anywhere in america but in chicago in the automobile business say i'd be as lonesome and deserted as the reading-room of an oaks club i don't quite understand allan began no said george turning to meet minot's smile but this gentleman does it all means allan that there's nothing doing you are lord harrowby the next earl of raybrook take the title and god bless you but george allan objected legally you can't don't worry allan said the man from chicago there's nothing we can't do in america and do legally how's this i've always been intending to take out naturalization papers i'll do it the minute i get back to chicago and then the title is yours in the meantime when you introduce me to your friends here we'll just pretend i've taken them out already allan harrowby got up and laid his hand affectionately on his brother's shoulder you're a brick old boy he said you always were i'm glad you're to be here for the wedding how did you happen to come that's right you don't know do you i came in response to a telegram from lloyd's of new york from uh, lloyd's asked allan blankly yes allan that yacht you came down here on didn't belong to martin wall it belonged to me he made away with it from north river because he happened to need it wall's a crook my boy 
the lilith your ship my word it is i called it the lady evelyn allan lloyd's found out that it had been stolen and sent me a wire so here i am lloyd's found out through me minot explained to the dazed allan oh i'm beginning to see said allan slowly by the way george we've another score to settle with wall he explained briefly how wall had acquired chain lightning's collar and returned a duplicate of paste in its place the elder harrowby listened with serious face it's no doubt the collar he was trailing you for allan he said and that's how he came to need the yacht but when finally he got his eager fingers on those diamonds poor old wall must have had the shock of his life how's that it wasn't wall who had the duplicate made it was father years ago when i was still at home he wanted money to bet as usual had the duplicate made risked and lost but allan objected he gave it to me to give to miss merrick surely he wouldn't have done that how old is he now eighty-two allan the old boy must be a little childish by now he forgot i'm sure he forgot that's the only view to take of it a silence fell in a moment the elder brother said allan i want you to assure me again that you're marrying because you love the girl and for no other reason straight george allan answered and looked his brother in the eye good kid there's nothing in the other kind of marriage all unhappiness all wrong i was sure you must be on the level but you see after mr thacker the insurance chap in new york knew who i was and that i wouldn't take the title he told me about that fool policy you took out no did he all about it sort of knocked me silly for a minute but i remember the harrowby gambling streak and if you love the girl and really want to marry her i can't see any harm in the idea however i hope you lose out on the policy everything okay now nothing in the way not a thing lord harrowby replied minot here has been a bully help worked like mad to put the wedding through i owe everything to him insuring a woman's mind reflected george harrowby not a bad idea allan almost worthy of an american still i could have insured you myself after a fashion promised you a good job as manager of our new london branch in case the marriage fell through however your method is more original allan harrowby was slowly pacing the room suddenly he turned and despite the fact that all obstacles were removed he seemed a very much worried young man george mr minot he began i've a confession to make it's about that policy he stopped the old family trouble george we're gamblers to the bone all of us last friday night at the manhattan club i turned over that policy to martin wall to hold as security for a five thousand dollar loan why the devil did you do that minot cried well and allan harrowby was in his old state of helplessness again i wanted to save the day gonzale was hounding us for money i thought i saw a chance to win but wall wall of all people i know i oughtn't to have done it new wall wasn't altogether straight but nobody else was about i got excited borrowed lost the whole of it too what what are we going to do he looked appealingly at minot but for once it was not on minot's shoulders that the responsibility for action fell george harrowby cheerfully took charge i was just on the point of going out to the yacht with an officer he said suppose we three run out alone and talk business with martin wall fifteen minutes later the two harrowbys and minot boarded the yacht which martin wall had christened the lilith george harrowby looked about him with interest he's taken very good care of it i'll say that for him he remarked martin wall came suavely forward mr wall said minot pleasantly allow me to present mr george harrowby the owner of the boat on which we now stand i beg our pardon said wall 
without the quiver of an eyelash so careless of me don't stand gentlemen have chairs all of you and he stared george harrowby calmly in the eye you're flippant this morning said the elder harrowby we'll be glad to sit thank you and may i repeat what mr minot has told you i own this yacht indeed mr wall's face beamed you bought it from wilson i presume just who is wilson why he's the man i rented it from in new york so that's your tale is it allan harrowby put in you wound me protested mr wall that is my tale as you call it i rented this boat in new york from a man named albert wilson i have the lease to show you also my receipt for one month's rent i'll bet you have commented minot bet anything you like you come from a betting institution i believe no mr wall i did not buy the yacht from wilson said george harrowby i've owned it for several years how do i know that asked martin wall glance over that said the elder harrowby taking a paper from his pocket a precaution you failed to take with albert wilson dear dear mr wall looked over the paper and handed it back can it be that wilson was a fraud i suggest the police mr harrowby i shall be very glad to testify i suggest the police too said minot hotly for mr martin wall if you thought you had a right on this boat wall why did you throw me overboard into the north river when i mentioned the name of lloyd's mr wall regarded him with pained surprise i threw you overboard because i didn't want you on my boat he said i thought you understood that fully nonsense minot cried you stole this boat by bribing the caretaker and when i mentioned lloyd's famous the world over as a marine insurance firm you thought i was after you and you threw me over the rail i see it all very clearly now you're a wise young man mr wall george harrowby broke in it may interest you to know that we don't believe a word of the wilson story but it may also interest you to know that i am willing to let the whole matter drop on one condition what's that my brother allan here borrowed five thousand dollars from you the other night and gave you as security a bit of paper quite worthless to anyone save himself accept my check for five thousand and hand him back the paper mr wall smiled he reached into his inner coat pocket with the greatest pleasure he said here is the um the document he laughed then noting the checkbook on the elder harrowby's knee he added there was a little matter of interest not at all george harrowby looked up the interest is forfeited to pay wear and tear on this yacht for a moment wall showed fight but he did not much care for the light he saw in the elder harrowby's eyes he recognized a vast difference in brothers oh very well he said the check was written and the exchange made since you are convinced i am the owner of the yacht said george harrowby rising i take it you will leave it at once as soon as i can remove my belongings wall said a most unfortunate affair all round a fortunate one for you commented mr minot wall glared my boy he said angrily did anyone ever tell you you were a bad luck jinx never smiled minot you look like one to me growled martin wall george harrowby arranged to keep the crew wall had engaged in order to get the lady evelyn back to new york it was thought best for the owner to stay aboard until wall had gathered his property and departed so allan harrowby and minot alone returned to san marco as they crossed the plaza allan said by gad everything looks lovely now jenkins out of the way good old george sidestepping the title the policy safe in my pocket not a thing in the way it's almost too good to be true replied minot with a very mirthless smile it must be a great relief to you old boy you have worked hard must feel perfectly jolly over all this 
me said minot oh i can hardly contain myself for joy i feel like twining orange blossoms in my hair he walked on kicking the gravel savagely at each step not a thing in the way now not a single solitary hopeful little thing End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of love insurance by earl der biggers this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter nineteen mr minot goes through fire the duchess of lismore elected to give her dinner and dance in miss meyrick's honor as near to the bright florida stars as she could on the top floor of the della pax was a private dining-room only partially enclosed with a picturesque view of the palm-dotted courtyard below adjacent to this was a sunroom with a removable glass roof and this the duchess had ordered transformed into a ballroom there in the open the newest society dances should rise to offend the soft southern sky being a good general the hostess was early on the scene marshalling her forces to her there came cynthia meyrick radiant and lovely and wide-eyed on the eve of her wedding how sweet you look cynthia said the duchess graciously but then you long ago solved the problem of what becomes you i have to look as sweet as i can replied the girl warily all the rest of my life i shall have to try and live up to the nobility she sighed to think remarked the duchess busy over a great bowl of flowers that to-morrow night this time little cynthia will be lady harrowby i suppose you'll go to rakedale hall for part of the year at least i suppose so i too have had my rakedale hall formal cynthia dear formal nothing but silly little hunts silly little shoots american men would die there as for american women nothing ever happens the hedges bloom in neat little rows the trees blossom they are bare again cynthia sometimes i've been in a state where i'd give ten years of my life just to hear the rattle of an elevated train she stood looking down at the girl an all too evident pity in her eyes it isn't all it might be i fancy marrying into the peerage cynthia said my dear replied the duchess i've nearly died at times i never was exactly what you call a patriot but often i've waked in the night and thought of detroit my little car rattling over the cobblestones a new gown tried on at madame harbier's a matinee and chocolate afterward at that little place you remember it at our house on woodward avenue the good times there on the veranda in the evening and jack little just back from college in the east running across the lawns to see me what became of jack dear he married elise perkins ah i know and they live near our old house have a box when the opera comes entertain the yale glee club every christmas oh cynthia maybe it's crude maybe it's middle class in english eyes but it's home when you introduce that brother of lord harrowby's this afternoon that big splendid chap who said america looked better than a title to him i could have thrown my arms about his neck and kissed him she came closer to the girl and stood looking down at her with infinite tenderness in her washed-out eyes wasn't there any american boy my dear she asked i i hundreds of them answered cynthia meyrick trying to laugh the duchess turned away it's wrong of me to discourage you like that she said marrying into the peerage is something after all you must come home every year insist on it johnson are these the best caviar bowls the hotel can furnish and the duchess of lismore late of detroit drifted off into a bitter argument with the humble johnson miss meyrick strolled away out upon a little balcony opening off the dining-room she stood gazing down at the waving fronds in the courtyard six stories below if only that fountain down there were ponce de leon's but it wasn't to-morrow she must put 
youth behind she must go far from the country she loved did she care enough for that strangely enough burning tears filled her eyes hot revolt surged into her heart she stood looking down meanwhile the other members of the dinner party were gathering with tender solicitude about their hostess in the ballroom beyond dick minot hopeless glum stalked moodily among them into the crowd drifted jack paddock his sprightly air noticeably lacking his eyes worried dreadful for the love of heaven minot asked as they stepped together into a secluded corner what ails you be gentle with me boy said paddock unhappily i'm in a horrible mess the graft dick the good old graft it's over and done with now what do you mean it happened last night after our wild chase of harrowby i was fussed excited i prepared two sets of repartee for my two customers to use to-night yes i always make carbon copies to refer to myself just before the stuff is to be used a few minutes ago i took out my copies dick i sent the same repartee to both of them good lord good lord is meek and futile so is damn put on your little rubber coat my boy i predict a hurricane in spite of his own troubles minot laughed mirth eh said paddock grimly i can't see it that way i'll be as popular as a republican in texas before this evening is over got a couple of hasty rapid-fire resignations already thought at first i wouldn't come but that seemed cowardly anyway this is my last appearance on any stage as a librettist kindly omit flowers and mr paddock drifted gloomily away while the servants were passing cocktails on gleaming trays minot found the door to the balcony and stepped outside a white wraith flitted from the shadows to his side mr minot said a soft scared little voice ah miss meyrick he cried merciful fate this that they met for the first time since that incident on the ramparts in kindly darkness miss meyrick began minot hurriedly i'm very glad to have a moment alone with you i want to apologize for last night i was mad i did harrowby a very palpable wrong i'm very ashamed of myself as i look back can i hope that you will forget all i said she did not reply but stood looking down at the palms far below can i hope that you will forget and forgive she glanced up at him and her eyes shone in the dusk i can forgive she said softly but i can't forget mr mr minot yes what what is woman's greatest privilege something in the tone of her voice sent a cold chill sweeping through minot's very soul he clutched the rail for support if if you'd answer said the girl it would make it easier for aunt mary's generous form appeared in the doorway oh there you are cynthia you are keeping the duchess at dinner waiting cynthia meyrick joined her aunt minot stayed behind a moment below him florida swam in the azure night what had the girl been about to say pulling himself together he went inside and learned that he was to take in to dinner a glorious blonde bridesmaid when they were seated he found that miss meyrick's face was hidden from him by a profusion of florida blossoms he was glad of that he wanted to think think a few others were thinking at that table mrs bruce and the duchess among them mrs bruce was mentally rehearsing the duchess glanced at her the wittiest woman in san marco thought the hostess bah mr paddock meanwhile was toying unhappily with his food he had little to say the attractive young lady he had taken in had already classified him as a bore most unjust of the attractive young lady it's lamentable really mrs bruce was speaking even in our best society conversation has given way to the turkey trot our wits are in our feet where once people talked art music literature now they tango madly it really seems everything you say is true interrupted the duchess blandly 
i sometimes think the race of the future will be a trotting race mrs bruce started perceptibly her eyes lighted with fire she had been working up to this line herself and the coincidence was passing strange she glared at the hostess mr paddock studied his plate intently i for one went on the duchess of lismore do not dance the tango or the turkey trot nor am i willing to take the necessary steps to learn them a little ripple ran round the table the ripple that up to now had been the exclusive privilege of mrs bruce that lady paled visibly she realized that there was no coincidence here it seems too bad too she said fixing the hostess firmly with an angry eye because women could have the world at their feet if they'd only keep their feet still long enough it was the turn of the duchess to start and start she did as one who could not believe her ears she stared at mrs bruce the wittiest hostess in san marco was militantly under way women are not what they used to be she continued either they are mad about clothes or they go to the other extreme and harbor strange ideas about the vote eugenics what not in fact the sex reminds me of the type of shop that abounds in a small town its specialty is dry goods and notions the duchess pushed away a plate which had only that moment been set before her she regarded mrs bruce with the eye of mrs pankhurst face to face with a prime minister we are hardly kind to our sex she said but i must say i agree with you and the extravagance of women half the women of my acquaintance wear gorgeous rings on their fingers while their husbands wear blue rings about their eyes mrs bruce's face was livid madam she said through her teeth what is it asked the duchess sweetly they sat glaring at each other then with one accord they turned to glare at mr jack paddock mr paddock prince of assurance was blushing furiously he stood the combined glare as long as he could then he looked up into the night how how close the stars seem he murmured faintly it was noted afterward that mrs bruce maintained a vivid silence during the remainder of that dinner the duchess on the contrary wrung from her purchased lines every possibility they held and in that embattled setting mr minot sat deaf to the delicious lisp of the debutante at his side what was woman's greatest privilege wasn't it his forehead grew damp his knees trembled beneath the table jephson thacker jephson thacker he said over and over to himself after dinner when the added guests invited by the duchess for the dance crowded the ballroom minot encountered jack paddock mr paddock was limp and pitiable ever apologize to an angry woman he asked ever try to expostulate with a storm at sea i've had it out with mrs bruce offered to do anything to atone she said the best thing i could do would be to disappear from san marco she's right i'm going this is my exit from the butterfly life and i don't intend to say good-bye to the duchess either i wish i could go with you said minot sadly well come along no i i'll stick it out see you later mr paddock slipped unostentatiously away in the direction of the elevator on a dais hidden by palms the orchestra began to play softly you haven't asked to see my card said cynthia meyrick at minot's side he smiled a wan smile and wrote his name opposite number five she drifted away the music became louder rising to the bright stars themselves the dances that had furnished so much bitter conversation at table began to break out minot hunted up the balcony and stood gazing miserably down at fairyland below there miss meyrick found him when the fifth dance was imminent is it customary for girls to pursue their partners she inquired i'm sorry he said weakly shall we go in it's so so glorious out here he sighed a sigh of resignation he turned to her you asked me 
what is woman's greatest privilege he said yes is it to change her mind she looked timidly into his eyes it is she whispered faintly the most miserably happy man in history he gasped cynthia it's too late you're to be married to-morrow do you mean you call it all off now at the last minute she nodded her head her eyes on the ground my god he moaned and turned away it would be all wrong to marry harrowby she said faintly because i've come to i oh dick can't you see see of course i see he clenched his fists cynthia my dearest below him stretched six stories of open space in his agony he thought of leaping over the rail of letting that be his answer but no it would disarrange things so it might even postpone the wedding cynthia he groaned you can't understand it mustn't be i've given my word i can't explain i can never explain but cynthia cynthia back in the shadow the girl pressed her hands to her burning cheeks a strange love yours she said a love that blows hot and cold cynthia that isn't true i do love you please please let us forget she stepped into the moonlight fine brave smiling do we dance cynthia he cried unhappily if you only understood i think i do the music has stopped harrowby has the next dance he'd hardly think of looking for me here she was gone minot stood alone on the balcony he was dazed blind trembling he had refused the girl without whom life could never be worth while refused her to keep the faith he entered upon the bright scene inside slipped unnoticed to the elevator and still dazed descended to the lobby he would walk in the moonlight until his senses were regained near the main door of the de la pax he ran into henry trimmer mr trimmer had a newspaper in his hand what's the matter with the women nowadays he demanded indignantly minot tried in vain to push by him seen what those london suffragettes have done now and trimmer pointed to a headline what have they done asked minot done they put dynamite under the statue of lord nelson in trafalgar square and blew it sky high it fell over into the strand good cried minot wildly good i hope to hell it smashed the whole of london and brushing aside the startled trimmer he went out into the night it was nearly twelve o'clock when mr minot somewhat calmer of mind returned to the de la pax as he stepped into the courtyard he was surprised to see a crowd gathered before the hotel then he noticed that from a second-floor window poured smoke and flame and that the town fire department was wildly getting into action he stopped his heart almost ceased beating that was her window the window to which he had called her on that night that seemed so far away last night breathlessly he ran forward and he ran straight into a group just descended from the ballroom of that group cynthia meyrick was a member for a moment they stood gazing at each other then the girl turned to her aunt my wedding dress she cried i left it lying on my bed oh i can't possibly be married to-morrow if that is burned there was a challenge in that last sentence and the young man for whom it was intended did not miss it mad with the injustice of life he swooped down on a fireman struggling with a wobbly ladder snatching away the ladder he placed it against the window from which the smoke and flame poured he ran up it here shouted the chief of the fire department laying angry hands on the ladder's base what you doing you can't go in there why the devil can't i bellowed minot let go of that ladder he plunged into the room the smoke filled his nostrils and choked him his eyes burned he staggered through the smoky dusk into another room his hands met the brass bars of a bed then closed over something soft and filmy that lay upon it he seized the something close and hurried back into the other room 
a fireman at another window sought to turn a stream of water on him water on that gown cut that out you fool minot shouted the fireman who had suspected himself of saving a human life looked hurt minot regained his window dishevelled smoky but victorious he half fell half climbed to the ground the fire chief faced him who was you trying to rescue the chief demanded his eyes grew wide you idiot he roared they ain't nobody in that dress damn it i know that minot cried he ran across the lawn and stood a panting limp battered ludicrous figure before cynthia meyrick i i hope it's the right one he said and held out the gown she took his offering and came very close to him i hate you she said in a low tone i hate you i i was afraid you would he muttered a shout from the fireman announced that the blaze was under control to his dismay minot saw that an admiring crowd was surrounding him he broke away and hurried to his room cynthia meyrick's final words to him rang in his ears savagely he tore at his ruined collar was this ridiculous farce never to end as if in answer a distant clock struck twelve he shuddered to-morrow at high noon End of chapter 19chapter twenty of love insurance by earl durr biggers this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter twenty please kill early tuesday morning while mr minot still slept and mercifully forgot two very wide-awake gentlemen sat alone together in the office of the san marco mail one was manuel gonzale proprietor of that paper as immaculate as the morn the other was that broad and breezy gentleman known in his present incarnation as mr martin wall very neat very neat indeed said mr wall gazing with evident approval at an inky smelling sheet that lay before him it ought to do the work if it does it will be the first stroke of luck i've had in san marco gonzale smiled revealing two even rows of very white teeth you do not like san marco he ventured mr wall snorted angrily like it does a beheaded man like the axe in a long and golden professional career i've never struck anything like this town before for hard luck i'm not in it twenty-four hours when i'm left alone my hands tied with stuff enough to make your eyes pop out of your head that's pleasant then after spending two months and a lot of money trailing lord harrowby for the family jewels i finally caught them i give the crew of my borrowed boat orders to steam far far away and run to my cabin to gloat do i gloat ask me i do not gloat i find the famous chain lightning's collar is a very superior collection of glass worth about twenty-three cents i send back the glass and stick around hoping for better days and the best i get is a call from the owner of my yacht with orders to vacate at once when i first came here i swore i'd visit that jewelry store again alone but there's a jinx after me in this town what's the use i'm going to get out but before you go smiled manuel one stroke of luck you shall have maybe i'll leave that to you this kind of thing he motioned toward the damp paper is not in my line he bent over a picture on the front page that came out pretty well didn't it lucky we got the photograph before big brother george arrived i have always found san marco lucky replied gonzale always with one trifling exception he drummed reminiscently on his desk i say who's this mr wall pointed to a line just beneath the name of the paper robert o'neill editor and proprietor he read manuel gonzale gurgled softly somewhere within which was his cunning non-committal way of indicating mirth ah my very virtuous managing editor he said one of those dogs who dealt so vilely with me i have told you of that manuel gonzale does not forget 
he leaned closer this morning at two after o'neill and howe had sent to-day's paper to press as usual Lupas, my circulation manager and i arrived my virtuous editors had departed to their rest Lupas and i stopped the presses we substituted a new first-page form o'neill and howe they will not know always they sleep until noon in this balmy climate it is easy to lie abed again manuel gonzale gurgled may their sleep be dreamless he said and should our work of the morning fail may the name of o'neill be the first to concern the police wall laughed a good idea he remarked he looked at his watch nine fifteen the banks ought to be open now gonzale got to his feet carefully he folded the page that had been lying on his desk the moment for action has come he said shall we go down to the street i'm in strange waters responded martin wall uneasily the first dip i've ever taken out of my line don't believe in it either a man should have his specialty and stick to it however i need the money am i letter perfect in my part i wonder the door of the mail office opened and a sly little cuban with an evil face stepped in ah lupas gonzale said you are here at last do you understand your boys they are to be in the next room yes you are to sit near that telephone and a word from my friend mr martin wall to-day's edition of the mail is to flood the streets the news stands instantly delay might be fatal is that clear i know said lupas very good said gonzale he turned to martin wall now is the time he added the two descended to the street opposite the hotel de la pax they parted the sleek little spaniard went on alone and mounted boldly those pretentious steps at the desk he informed the clerk on duty that he must see mr spencer meyrick at once but mr meyrick is very busy to-day the clerk objected say this is life and death replied gonzale and the clerk wilting telephoned the millionaire's apartments for nearly an hour gonzale was kept waiting nervously he paced the lobby consuming one cigarette after another glancing often at his watch finally spencer meyrick appeared pompous red-faced a hard man to handle as he always had been the spaniard noted this and his slits of eyes grew even narrower will you come with me he asked suavely it is most important he led the way to a summer-house in a far forgotten corner of the hotel grounds protesting spencer meyrick followed the two sat down i have something to show you said gonzale politely and removed from his pocket a copy of the san marco mail still damp from the presses spencer meyrick took the paper in his own large capable hands he glanced casually at the first page and his face grew somewhat redder than its wont a huge headline was responsible harrowby wasn't taking any chances underneath in slightly smaller type spencer meyrick read remarkable foresight of english fortune hunter who weds miss meyrick to-day took out a policy for seventy five thousand pounds with lloyd's saying to be payable in case the beautiful heiress suffered a change of heart prominent on the page was a large photograph which purported to be an exact facsimile of the policy mr meyrick examined it he glanced through the story which happened to be commendably brief he told himself he must remain calm avoid fireworks think quickly laying the paper on his knee he turned to the little white garbed man beside him what trick is this he asked sharply it is no trick sir said gonzale pleasantly it is the truth that is a photograph of the policy old myrick studied the cut again i'll be damned he remarked i have no desire to annoy gonzale went on but there are five thousand copies of to-day's mail at the office ready to be distributed at a signal from me think sir newsboys on the street with that story at the very moment when your daughter becomes lady harrowby i see said meyrick slowly blackmail manuel gonzale shuddered in horror oh i beg of you 
he protested that is hardly it a business proposition i should call it it happens that the men back of the star publishing company which issues the mail have grown tired of the newspaper game in san marco they are desirous of closing out the plant at once say this morning it occurs to them that you might be very glad to purchase the mail before the next edition goes on the street you're a clever little dog said merrick through his teeth you are not exactly complimentary however let us say for the argument you buy the mail at once i am by the way empowered to make the sale you take charge you hurry to the office you destroy all copies of to-day's issue so far printed you give orders to the composing room to kill this first page story good as it is please kill you say a term with newspaper men you call yourself a newspaper man why not this story is killed another is put in its place say for example an elaborate account of your daughter's wedding and in its changed form the mail your newspaper goes on the street um and your price it is a valuable property especially valuable this morning i take it sneered merrick valuable at any time our presses cost a thousand our linotypes two thousand and there is that other thing so hard to estimate indefinitely the wide appeal of our paper the price well fifteen thousand dollars extremely reasonable and i will include the good will of the retiring management you contemptible little began spencer merrick my dear sir control yourself pleaded gonzale or i may be unable to include the good will i spoke of would you care to see that story on the streets you may at any moment there is but one way out buy the newspaper buy it now here is the plan you go with me to your bank you procure fifteen thousand in cash we go together to the mail office you pay me the money and i leave you in charge old merrick leapt to his feet very good he cried come on one more thing continued the crafty gonzale it may pay you to note we are watched even now all the way to the bank and thence to the office of the mail we will be watched should any accident now unforeseen happen to me that issue of the mail will go on sale in five minutes all over san marco spencer meyrick stood glaring down at the little man in white his enthusiasm of a moment ago for the journey vanished however the headlines of the mail were staring up at him from the bench he stooped pocketed the paper and growled i understand come on there must be some escape the trap seemed absurdly simple across the hotel lawn down the hot avenue in the less hot plaza meyrick sought away a naturally impulsive man he had difficulty restraining himself but he thought of his daughter whose happiness was more than money in his eyes no way offered at the counter of the tiny bank meyrick stood writing his check gonzale at his elbow suddenly behind them the screen door slammed and a wild-eyed man with flaming red hair rushed in what is it you want gonzale screamed out of my way don quixote cried the red-topped one i'm a windmill and my arms breathe death are you mr meyrick well tear up that check gladly said meyrick only notice the catbirds down here went on the wild one noisy little beasts aren't they well after this take off your hat to em. a catbird saved you a lot of money this morning i'm afraid i don't follow said the dazed spencer meyrick no i'll explain i have been working on this man's paper for the last week so has a very good friend of mine we knew he was crooked but we needed the money and he promised us not to pull off any more blackmail while we stayed last night after we left the office he arranged this latest plan to incriminate me you little devil manuel frightened leapt away we usually sleep until noon went on o'neill he counted on that enter the catbird sat on our window-sill at ten a m and screeched woke us up 
we felt uneasy went to the office broke down a bolted door and found what was up dog foamed manuel i'll cast a begutter save your compliments mr meyrick my partner is now at the mail office destroying today's issue of the mail we've already ruined the first page form the cut of the policy and the negative and we're going north as fast as the lord'll let us you can do what you please arrest our little lemon-tinted employer if you want to spencer meyrick stood considering however i've done you a favor odell went on you can do me one let manuel off on one condition name it that he hands me at once two hundred dollars one hundred for myself the other for my partner it's legitimate salary money due us we need it a long walk to new york i myself began myrick don't want your money said o'neill want gonzales gonzales you shall have agreed meyrick you pay him never cried the spaniard then it's the police hinted o'neill gonzale took two yellow bills from a wallet he tossed them at o'neill there you cur careful cried o'neill or i'll punch you yet he started forward but gonzale hastily withdrew o'neill and the millionaire followed to the street just as well commented meyrick i should not have cared to cause his arrest it would have meant country-wide publicity he laid a hand on the arm of the newspaper man i take it he said that your fortunes are not at the highest ebb you have done me a very great service i propose to write two checks one for you one for your partner and you may name the amounts but the red-haired one shook his head no he replied nix on the anticlimax to virtue on a rampage we can't be paid for it it was sort of dim the glory we've got the railroad fare at last and we're going away from here yes away from here on the choo-choo riding far riding north well my boy answered spencer meyrick if i can ever do anything for you in new york come and see me you may have to make good on that laughed o'neill and they parted o'neill hastened to the mail office he waved yellow bills before the lanky howe in the nick of time he cried me the fair-haired hero and here's the fair harry the good old railroad fair heaven be praised said howe i've finished the job bob not a trace of this morning's issue left the fair north and parlor cars my tobacco heart sings can't you hear the elevated music harry music and the newsboys on park row caruso can't touch them where can we find a timetable i wonder meanwhile in a corner of the plaza manuel gonzale spoke sad words in the ear of martin wall it's the jinx moaned wall with conviction the star player in everything i do down here i'm going to burn the sand hot footing it away but whither manuel whither in puerto rico replied gonzale i have not yet plied my trade i go there palm beach sighed wall has diamonds that can be observed to sparkle as far away as the new york society columns but alas i lack the wherewithal to support me in the style to which my victims are accustomed try puerto rico suggested gonzale the air is mild so are the police i will stake you thanks puerto rico it is how the devil do we get there up the main avenue of san marco spencer meyrick walked as a man going to avenge with every determined step his face grew redder his eye more dangerous he looked at his watch eleven the eleventh hour but much might happen between the eleventh hour and high noon End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of Love Insurance by Earl Durr Beggars. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter Twenty One High Words at High Noon. In the Harrowby suite, the holder of the title, a handsome and distinguished figure adorned for his wedding, walked nervously the rather worn carpet 
his brother hastily pressed into service as best man sat puffing his cigar with a persistency which indicated a somewhat perturbed state of mind on his own part brace up allan he urged it'll be over before you realize it remember my own wedding gad wasn't i frightened always that way with a man no sense to it but he just can't help it never forget that little parlor with the flower of marion society all about and me with my teeth chattering and my knees knocking together it is a bit of an ordeal said allan weakly jack feels all sort of gone inside the telephone ringing sharply interrupted george harrowby rose and stepped to it allan you wish allan very well i'll tell him he turned away from the telephone and faced his brother it was old maverick kid seemed somewhat hot under the collar wants to see you in their suite at once what what do you imagine he wants going to make you a present of riverside drive i fancy go ahead boy i'll wait for you here allan harrowby went out along the dusky corridor to the meyrick door not without misgivings he knocked a voice boomed come he pushed open the door he saw spencer meyrick sitting purple at a table and beside him cynthia meyrick in the loveliest gown of all the lovely gowns she had ever worn the beauty of the girl staggered harrowby a bit never demonstrative he had a sudden feeling that he should be at her feet you you sent for me he asked coming into the room as he moved closer to the girl he was to marry he saw that her face was whiter than her gown and her brown eyes strained and miserable we did said meyrick rising he held out a paper will you please look at that his lordship took the sheet in unsteady hands he glanced down slowly the meaning of the story that met his gaze filtered through his dazed brain martin wall did this he thought to himself he tried to speak but could not dumbly he stared at spencer meyrick we want no scene harrowby said the old man wearily we merely want to know if there is in existence a policy such as the one mentioned here the paper slipped from his lordship's lifeless hands he turned miserably away not daring to face either father or daughter he answered very faintly there is spencer meyrick sighed that's all we wanted to know there will be no wedding harrowby what his lordship faced about why sir the guests must be downstairs it is unfortunate but there will be no wedding the old man turned to his daughter cynthia he asked have you nothing to say yes white trembling the girl faced his lordship it seems allan that you have regarded our marriage as a business proposition you have gambled on the stability of the market well you win i have changed my mind this is final i shall not change it again cynthia and any who had considered lord harrowby unfeeling must have been surprised at the anguish in his voice i have loved you i love you now i adore you what can i say in explanation of this we gamble all of us it is a passion bred in the family that is why i took out this absurd policy my dearest it doesn't mean that there was no love on my side there is there always will be whatever happens can't you understand the girl laid her hand on his arm and drew him away to the window it's no use allan she said for his ears alone perhaps i could have forgiven but somehow i don't care as i thought i did it is better embarrassing as it may be for us both that there should be no wedding after all cynthia you can't mean that you don't believe me let me send for my brother he will tell you of the passion for gambling in our family he will tell you that i love you too he moved toward the telephone no use said cynthia meyrick shaking her head it would only prolong a painful scene please don't allan i'll send for minot too harrowby cried mr minot 
the girl's eyes narrowed and what has mr minot to do with this everything he came down here as the representative of lloyd's he came down to make sure that you didn't change your mind he will tell you that i love you a queer expression hovered about miss meyrick's lips spencer meyrick interrupted nonsense he cried there is no need to one moment cynthia meyrick's eyes shone strangely send for your brother allan and for mr minot harrowby stepped to the telephone he summoned his forces a strained and happy silence ensued then the two men entered the room together minot george old boy lord harrowby said helplessly miss meyrick and her father have discovered the existence of a certain insurance policy about which you both know they have believed that my motive in seeking a marriage was purely mercenary that my affection for the girl who is was to have become my wife cannot be sincere they are wrong quite wrong both of you know that i've sent for you to help me make them understand i cannot george harrowby stepped forward and smiled his kindly smile my dear young lady he said i regret that policy very deeply when i first heard of it i too suspected allan's motives but after i talked with him after i saw you i was convinced that his affection for you was most sincere i thought back to the gambling schemes for which the family has been noted i saw it was the old passion cropping out anew in allan that he was really not to blame that beyond any question he was quite devoted to you otherwise i'd have done everything in my power to prevent the wedding yes miss meyrick's eyes flashed dangerously and your other witness allan the soul of the other witness squirmed in agony this was too much too much you minot pleaded harrowby you have understood i have felt that you were sincerely fond of miss meyrick minot replied otherwise i should not have done what i have done then mr minot the girl inquired you think i would be wrong to give up all plans for the wedding i i yes i do right minot and you advise me to marry lord harrowby at once mr minot passed his handkerchief over his damp forehead had the girl no mercy i do he answered miserably cynthia meyrick laughed harshly mirthlessly <laughs> because that's your business your mean little business she said scornfully i know at last why you came to san marco i understand everything you had gambled with lord harrowby and you came here to see that you did not lose your money well you've lost carry that news back to the concern you work for in spite of your heroic efforts you've lost at the last moment cynthia meyrick changed her mind lost the word cut minot to the quick lost indeed lost to jephson's stake lost the girl he loved he had failed jephson failed himself after all he had done all he had sacrificed a double defeat and therefore doubly bitter cynthia surely you don't mean lord harrowby was pleading i too allan said the girl more gently it was true what i told you there by the window it is better father will you go down and say i'm not to be married after all spencer meyrick nodded and turned toward the door cynthia cried harrowby brokenly there was no reply old meyrick went out i'm sorry his lordship said sorry i made such a mess of it the more so because i love you cynthia and always shall good-bye he held out his hand she put hers in it it's too bad allan she said but it wasn't to be and even now you have one consolation the money that lloyd's must pay you the money means nothing cynthia miss meyrick is mistaken minot interrupted lord harrowby has not even that consolation lloyd's owes him nothing why not asked the girl defiantly up to an hour ago said minot you were determined to marry his lordship i should hardly put it that way but i intended to 
yes then you changed your mind why i changed it because i found out about this ridiculous this insulting policy then his lordship's taking out of the policy caused the calling off of the wedding yes why it may interest you to know and it may interest lord harrowby to recall that five minutes before he took out this policy he signed an agreement to do everything in his power to bring about the wedding and he further promised that if the wedding should be called off because of any subsequent act of his he would forfeit the premium by god said lord harrowby the taking out of the policy was a subsequent act continued minot the premium i fancy is forfeited he's got you allan said george harrowby coming forward and i for one can't say i'm sorry you're going to tear up that policy now and go to work for me i for one am sorry cried miss meyrick her flashing eyes on minot i wanted you to win allan i wanted you to win why minot asked innocently you ought to know she answered and turned away lord harrowby moved toward the door we're not hard losers he said blankly but everything's gone it's a bit of a smash-up good-bye cynthia good-bye allan and good luck thanks and harrowby went out with his brother minot stood for a time not daring to move cynthia meyrick was at the window her scornful back was not encouraging finally she turned saw minot and gave a start of surprise oh you you're still here cynthia now you understand he said you know why i acted as i did you realized my position i was in a horrible fix she looked at him coldly yes she said i do understand you were gambling on me you came down here to defend your employer's cash well you have succeeded is there anything more to be said isn't there on the ramparts of the old fort the other night please do not make yourself any more ridiculous than is necessary you have put your employer's money above my happiness always really you looked rather cheap to-day with your sanctimonious advice that i marry harrowby aren't you beginning to realize your own position the silly childish figure you cut then you last night when you came staggering across the lawn to me with this foolish gown in your arms i told you i hated you do you imagine i hate you any less now well i don't her voice became tearful i hate you i hate you but some day she turned away from him for she was sobbing outright now i never want to see you again as long as i live she cried never 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 limp pitiable worn by the long fight he had waged minot stood staring helplessly at her heaving shoulders then i can only say i'm sorry he murmured and good-bye he waited she did not turn toward him he stumbled out of the room End of chapter twenty one